the Thursday after the spring game. That is ideal investing time. And on the podcast daily, that's exactly what we're going to do. That's right. It's stock watch time. That's Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward. Berm, you're up first. What hot, juicy stock goss you got for us five days after the spring game? I'm just going to reiterate something I said earlier in the week, and I'm I'm going to tell people to maybe uh, think about offloading a little bit of Kenyatta Jackson stock because there's been so much of it out there, and I just don't know that it's going to happen uh, in the way that we thought it was going to, especially with the emergence of guys like Edric Houston, of Mitchell Melton, of Caden Curry, like the idea that it was a surefire bet that, that there was going to be JT Tumaloa and Jack Sawyer, and then you're going to play Kenyatta Jackson and Caden. I don't know that that is as cut and dried as it was. And so for that very reason alone, I would say that that stock may um, be either in a hold position. I don't know that you're wanting him to go out and buy more yet. That's, I guess, what I'm trying to say. I I mean, if you got it, hold on to it because he's athletically a freak and that that moment may come. But I I just don't know that it sets up quite as uh, clearly as we had thought make eight months ago. I don't think we've ever had Berm take a negative stock position, let alone begin the show with one, Bill. I don't want it to be negative. I'm just saying, like, realistically, that was my biggest takeaway after the spring game. Like, there was, I thought that the Buckeyes had three or three and a half defensive ends, and now I think maybe they have six. Mm. So that'd be interesting. Okay. Three and a half would be weird. That'd be hard to manage. Well, you know, when you're dealing which, with Neger, half? well, I mean, there's the <laughs> upper half. Caden, Caden Curry's upper half. I, I know the knee girth is, is always a concern. <laughs> Very important. Is it still yeah. a concern? I don't know. His knees uh, look pretty girthy to me. Yeah, he's girth, girthed up. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you're looking for. We're off to a great start on the podcast daily Thursday stock watch. Do you guys Bill think Caden- that I'm crazy for that? I mean, am I, am I wrong? I no, I don't think you're wrong. I'm just I'm just surprised that's where we started. <laughs> yeah, it's been on my mind for the last couple of days. I'm like, yeah, uh, it it just annoyed me because we've talked so much about Kenyatta Jackson in the last year, and there was all the hype and worry about what he was doing in December. And then I would have just uh, I would have expected that this spring would have been a launching pad for him, and I and it didn't seem like it became the the launching pad we we anticipated. Not saying it can't still happen, but I'm just saying maybe like let's temper the expectations a skosh. I think I said maybe a month and a half ago. I'm trying to remember when exactly in spring camp that the defensive linemen all came out and talked. But when Kenyatta Jackson talked about his offseason and like the decision to stick around and the you know conversations about his role with Larry Johnson. Everybody else seemed like really gung ho and bought in and all in with their with the plan for being at Ohio State and working with the Rushman. Except I didn't feel that way with Kenyatta Jackson. Like, in again, sometimes we read too many things into what is said. The tea leaves are inaccurate when we look at them. Um, but I remember talking about that in the middle of spring camp. That was like. Well, that seems odd. It doesn't feel like Kenyatta Jackson is saying the rest of the same thing as the rest of the room. Yeah, no, I the the vibes that didn't quite match up. I guess is maybe the way that I, I would put it. I think I think that's a fair way to describe it. I I don't know. I I want to believe he just looks like he should be awesome. You know what I mean? Like I and like I, I realize like that doesn't always equate to much. Like Javante Jean Baptiste looked like he should be awesome too, and it never really clicked for him here. It was better for him at Notre Dame, but it never really clicked for him at, at Ohio State. And sometimes it doesn't happen, but. Kenyatta's going into what his third year now. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I could also see a situation where like it takes like he's not. I, I wouldn't call him a young guy, but he's relatively inexperienced still, I suppose. And when your situation changes the way that his did with Jack and JT both deciding to come back, like I could see how that's like a pretty difficult hurdle to get over too. So um, maybe that takes some time, and and hopefully he can because I still think he can be a good player. Yeah, and he's never been the most like em- emoting player on the team. He's not a guy that is very vocal about things, and so I think at times maybe the the cool, almost uh, disinterested slash aloof personality that he has can come across in the wrong as disinterested. And I don't think he actually is. It's just his personality. But I mean, my my feelings on it are more about the on field production that we saw in the spring versus that 
um, conversation we had with him a month ago or however long it was ago now, but it just seems like there's, there, there's a moment coming for him. And I think most of us anticipated it would have come during his sophomore season and it didn't. And now the expectation was, okay, now it'll definitely happen in the spring and it didn't. And I just don't know, like, are, are we putting too much hype into him at this point? Um, because clearly other guys are, are moving up the pecking order. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think any of that is wrong. Should we I edit it and put it at the back of the show? Would it, would that make it better? <laughs> no, no, no. It's good. Yeah, I, I, I like it better when the real, the real poop comes from Berm, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's a freak athlete, man. I just want to see it on the field. I just want to see it happen. Okay, I'll take it, right. Bill. What do you got? Uh, I'll, I'll buy a little Tiger Shabola stock. I think I, I still I don't I don't know where this right side of the offensive line thing is is going. Right, we're we're sitting here recording this on Wednesday for Thursday morning, and there's not really anybody in the transfer portal. We got to let Come them. Know, we we have to tell them that just in case anything happens in the transfer portal. We're really, <laughs> just now burying my favorite joke of all time. Well, blame, this week is just being portal. destroyed. Okay. Play the transfer portal. Um, Curse you, transfer portal. Yeah, there's like nothing out there that is super impressive to me at all, really, when it comes to what Ohio State is is looking for. And I still like I still think the answers could very much be in, in the room. And I liked what I saw in Tegra in the spring game. Um, I thought Seth McLaughlin and and Carson Hinsman looked okay next to each other at times too, with with Carson playing guard. I know Carson had that that one play where Jack kind of knocked them back in the Will Howard's lap, but that you know, wasn't really the entire game for for Carson when he was playing guard. So I think it could be either one of those guys. I'm I'm probably a little cooler at the moment on the on the prospects of Luke Montgomery starting at right guard in the fall, but a lot can change between now and then, obviously. But I I was just like eager to see what it would look like with Tegra playing with that first group. I thought it looked pretty good, with the exception of the one play where they like had him pull and try to block JT in space, and JT just kind of like ran around him. I maybe wouldn't do that again, but. If you keep him on the, his, his side of the line, and especially on, on run plays, I, I thought he handled himself quite well. So um, it seems like the arrow is pointing up at the very least. I was kind of unsure of what kind of trajectory Tegra was on kind of in the middle of spring. And coming out of spring practice, it seems like he's got a legitimate shot maybe to, to win that right guard battle. So with the chances of that being slightly better than they were at the start of spring, I'll, I'll take a little Tegra stock. Good. I was worried. Berm started us out negative, and then you just swerved us right back into a normal show by taking That's the offensive right. line. That's right. Ooh. You're welcome. Thank you. I've, I'm really uh, enamored with this rising young talent in the coaching profession by the name of Chip Kelly. Uh, I think he's got a bright future as an offensive mind. He's got something. Yeah. I would, I, I've said this a couple times. Like, I wish that we had got more into – some of the things that we observed and heard and saw at the coaches clinic because it is so informative and it's one of my favorite few days of the year. And so on Thursday night, you know, Burn, what were you listening to on Thursday night? Did you go, you went to Tim Walton, right? I listened to Tim Walton. I listened to Matt Guerrero. I listened to Brian Hartline, listened to Carlos Lachlan, listened to Chip Kelly. Uh, I tried to give a handful of minutes to pretty much everyone. I did not listen to Ryan day for a single second. So I don't know if yeah. he's heard anything important. I, I was talking about like just the main podium session where Chip Kelly talked about the stretch oh, run play. That was Chip Kelly. I was, I was over at Chip Kelly, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the best presentations that I think I've ever watched. The other would be Jim Knowles during his first offseason and learning about the way he liked to disguise coverages and looks and pressures and went through. They basically did the same thing, Bill, right? Like, I here's one play. You're going to talk about, I don't even remember what coverage Jim Knowles was talking about. They're showing the different looks uh, and pressures that he could build off of it. And Chip Kelly on Thursday night was talking about stretch run. And then that wound in up being like 20 different variations and formations mm -hmm. and blocking schemes. And I was, I just remember looking to you at one point and was like, I don't remember seeing Ohio State ever run stretch like this before. And that's <laughs> pretty darn good. And you're looking at it, it's like, well, those aren't even like NFL caliber linemen at UCLA. Why hasn't Ohio State done more of this? Like Justin Fry and Ryan Day have worked under Chip Kelly. What makes it different when he's calling the shots? Like, I don't know, but I was blown away by that. Then, you know, uh, he stayed and did his 
uh, whiteboard talk until they were about until they were turning the lights off in the woody. And then Friday we started seeing the the T formation and the reverse pivot shift, whatever Will Howard was doing to get under center, that they did that again on Saturday. Like the appreciation and knowledge of the history of college football and like be, being able to take it to that next level. Uh, Chip Kelly's reputation, I guess, is already well known, but I would say it's even more well deserved after just getting to spend a little bit of time around him this spring. Every time we talk to talk to him, or I guess, or around him as he's talking, um, I get more and more confident that this offense is going to be exactly what it needs to be this year. Like I, I they don't have like a CJ Stroud at quarterback, right? So it could take on a little bit of a different look than we've come to expect from Ohio State offenses under Ryan Day, but it doesn't mean it, it won't be a good offense and, and get back to like scoring and being efficient and productive the way that we expect it to be. I just feel like whatever the answers are for this offense, Chip's going to find them, especially at a time when like he doesn't have to worry about anything else other than finding those answers. Like I am, it's like, I know it's not the craziest thing in the world. So like, I think Chip Kelly's going to do a good job with offense, <laughs> but I, but I really like, it's, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air, I think to, to see or, or to think about what he could do for this offense. I think that it is one of the greatest gifts that Ryan Day maybe will have ever been given uh, as a head coach is not that he hired Chip Kelly, but that Bill O'Brien took the Boston College job. Uh, because I think that the relationship and respect that he has for for Chip Kelly is so different, and it and it will permeate throughout the building in, in a way that is entirely. I was worried. Like Justin Fry is a guy who, when he came to Ohio State, there was a lot of discussion about, okay, he's the next offensive coordinator. He's going to be a guy that's in line to be a head coach. He comes in, he's a run game coordinator. He has some other titles. Brian Hartline gets promoted a year ago. And, it, you know, there's the talk about what, what he does next and is he going to be a head coach in the near future. And I think that there was at least a potential for Chip Kelly to come in and rock the boat a little bit and maybe upset some egos. And there has been none of that. The one thing that I wanted to ask all of the offensive coaches about on Thursday when we were at the coaches clinic was to try to just get a sense of, of how they felt about Chip Kelly being in the room. And maybe it's just them understanding the, the assignment or maybe it's just not wanting to say anything. Uh, but there was like glowing reviews about Chip Kelly from, from everyone that I talked to. And it was like, I love the fact that he's here. I, he has changed my relationship with coach day. He has allowed me to, speak more freely. He like it, it has changed everyone's perspective on the offensive side of the ball. And I think that it is an absolute gift for Ryan Day because I'm I don't think that that would have been the case uh for Bill O'Brien because I don't believe that Ryan Day would have been as willing to surrender the offense to Chip or to Bill O'Brien despite the fact that he hired him with the intention of doing so. I think you're right. Uh, there's no way for us to know that for sure, but, um, and as far as educated guesses go, I think that's probably correct. And having the intention to do it, it was the same thing that Ryan day had a year ago with Brian Hartline and he just couldn't bring himself to do it for whatever reason. Now, Bill O'Brien has a lot longer coaching resume, uh, certainly than Brian Hartline did a year ago. Um, but I think the other thing that we mentioned, right, when it happened was like, well, Bill O'Brien's probably going to do some things to tweak the passing attack like that seems where his forte really is even though he could you know adapt really to any personnel that he's had throughout his career what this offense needed more than anything was some fresh ideas for the rushing attack and chip kelly's got those so i think that's the part that really has me excited to watch and see where that goes bill you had made note the other day of the way that ryan day addressed the coaches and do you think he would have addressed bill o'brien as bill or as coach o'brien uh bill yeah he was it was during um one it was during the chalk talks at the coaches clinic and ryan day was just running through a bunch of stuff and as he referenced members of his staff it was always first name first name first name and unless it was chip kelly he called him coach which like maybe is just a slip right because chip kelly has been coached for much of ryan day's life and i don't i really hope that doesn't come off the wrong way i think it just speaks to like the relationship and trust that exists there um but to berm's point i think is going to be like really good for everybody well, you heard it here first. Chip Kelly is a good yeah. coach. Burn, what else you got? That we spent six minutes on that. Um, it's <laughs> unnecessary. Uh, I, I think those things are worthwhile. The coaching clinic is the best part of like the entire year for me. And there's a lot of things that we learn. We haven't really talked about that yeah. that much. Uh, 
to somewhat spin off of what you said, I'm going to go stock up on the quarterbacks uh, altogether because of the opportunity to work with Chip Kelly. But really, despite some turnovers on Saturday, I just really like what I saw from those guys, from from Will Howard, from Devin Brown, uh, from Julian Sane, who had played more snaps than anybody, from uh, Lincoln Keenholz, despite it, he had a, he had some rough moments. But I think those are important. I think it's good to have rough moments in, in a setting like that where it doesn't actually hurt you, especially for a kid who's been on campus for eight months or for three months like uh, Julian Sane or Aaron Nolanda. And I think that in general, if you're not feeling more comfortable about the quarterback room at the end of this spring compared to the end of last spring, then you're not really paying attention. Uh, and I, I think that in in some, the quarterback room is in a much better place. And I, I really think that no matter who ends up being the quarterback come August, they are going to find a way to do the things that needed to be done a year ago that didn't get done when it's third and three, finding that extra gear, stretching for a first down, stepping up in the pocket and, and, and dumping the ball off when it needs to be dumped off. I just feel like this this quarterback room is going to understand the the big picture of their role better than they did a year ago. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I was encouraged by Saturday. I'm trying to make that quick. Okay. I agree. I like it. Well said. Um, I'll, I want to, can, can I, can I package two players together and just say the two freshman running backs? Can I do whatever you want? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. here. And I, I, like, we've talked a decent amount about, about James peoples. So I, I think people know at least how I feel about him. And I think we're all pretty high on his potential, but like uh, Sam Williams Dixon was really impressive to me in, in the spring game. And he is uh, someone like, as a, like coming in, you're like, is he going to play running back? Is he going to play receiver? Could he possibly end up playing like defensive back? And, and I think when you talk about a player in those terms, you might think of, a more finesse kind of player and and he's got like a decent amount of physicality with the way that he runs the ball and he's built pretty well i think he's over 200 pounds already maybe he needs to get a little bit bigger if he's going to be like an every down back at a place like ohio state but he'll he'll get there i think he's only a freshman but i i was like kind of uncertain i guess um of what he might be able to provide long term as a running back and, and like it was a spring game so i'm not saying he answered all of those questions for me but uh i i th- was pretty impressed. Like, and, and he changed my mind a little bit. I think about the type of player he is. I, I, I thought that he might like look to me like more of a receiver who's trying to play running back. And that was not the case. Like I thought he was probably equally as impressive as James people's was um, in that spring game. And people's popped the, uh, maybe a few more times, like in the practices we watched, but in the game, which I think means a little more 80,000 people, you know, you're, you're feeling the pressure of that. And, and I thought he performed pretty well, Sam. Did. So um, it was a reminder of the depth in the room with the loss of Dallin Hayden, but also a reminder of like how bright I think the future can be with, with both those guys kind of as the running backs of the future. Burn, were you always convinced that Sam Williams Dixon would stick at running back? Or did you think like the athlete tag was going to force him elsewhere? I think that he always knew he was going to get his first opportunity at running back and it was going to be up to him to go out and prove it. When Ohio State lost Jordan Lyle on signing day to Miami, it put them in a situation where I think the uh, the discussion changed pretty considerably. Um, if you look right now at the safety depth and the running back depth, like you could see an, an, an argument where he could maybe have had an opportunity to help in either spot. But Sam's always wanted to play running back. That's what he wanted to do when he was recruited initially by Tony Alford. Um, and that was always going to be his goal. It was, it, and certainly as a high school player, he didn't play a lot of defense, but he has the athletic traits that they liked for the defensive side of the ball, but that's not happening now. He is, he is locked in and, and will stay at running back. Yeah. I thought he looked good really throughout spring. Every time the, the five various windows that we had, I was impressed. He did do some things out of the, the backfield that caught my attention as a receiving threat. I thought mm-hmm. that that separated him not not elevated separated made him different than what james peoples could do but they both did really encouraging things so that's i think that's a good one bill i there's a dip in the value of the tight end stock right now it was never maybe all that high going into spring but i'm gonna take advantage of that and scoop some up i've been i remember talking about it a week or two into camp and like keenan bailey's mindset and like it seemed like he was really you know grinding not as as optimistic and sunny as he normally is. But I think by the end of the last couple weeks, as Will Kazmarek got more comfortable, as Jelani Thurman continued to develop his skills, 
you still have the veteran leadership there and, and G Scott's ability to help and maybe do most of the work as the receiving threat from that group. I think that it, they're in a better spot than I would have imagined a month ago when it seemed like, oh no, like, can they even play 12 personnel anymore? No, they're not going to do the same things that Cade Stover did or Jeremy Ruckert. I don't think that this offense is going to be designed to throw to the tight ends 40, 50 times. But guess what? At Ohio State, that almost never happens anyway. The last couple of years were an exception to that. When it comes to handling the blocking responsibilities, I know that there are enough snaps and reps and film from spring camp for Ohio State to feel good about Will Kazmarek doing that, Bennett Christian doing that, uh, Jelani Thurman progressing there as an all-around threat, and G. Scott having the, the ability to help and then supplement as a receiving threat. I think they can get where they want to go at tight end in a way that a month ago I had questions about. And so if I cause the dip with insider training, cool. I'm going to take advantage of it now by buying it back up. It's interesting to me. Like, I, I think like if you if you were to rank the individual tight ends of like the last like eight years or so, maybe it, you, you have to go through a couple before you get to anybody in this room. But if you rank like the overall rooms in terms of like depth and number of guys that you think can actually help you, this one probably is closer to the top, right? It's like a, it's like a weird dynamic, but I I don't know. I'd almost rather have like a deeper room than like one guy and then separation to a bunch of guys that you don't think can play. Which is what we saw last year, right? Sorry. Yeah. Like no. Especially when you have a guy like Jelani Thurman, who upside wise and potential, if he puts it all together, may be better than anyone that they've had in the last mm -hmm. six years. Yeah. I, and I, I, I'm sorry for leaving out Patrick Gerd in that conversation. I, I, I shouldn't overlook that. He's just because he's a walk on. He he played in meaningful situations for Ohio State late last year. We saw him getting out there. He was in the middle of that T formation, right, to start the game last week. He so, was. Yep. You know, <laughs> Ohio State certainly thinks very highly of him as well. So I, that's that's a bad exclusion on my part. But you add that in, like that's having a walk on who can do some of the fullback stuff is what made Mitch Rossi a favorite of the podcast daily uh, two years ago. So if they if that's what they're getting back to, cool. Like, sign me up. I'll watch it. I, I remember last year when they wouldn't tell us who the fullback was. It was like a state secret. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Austin, you asked. why do you even care? Shut up. <laughs> and it ended up being Caden Curry and Caden McDonald. Uh, maybe, maybe I was on to something. Like, give me a real answer. Uh, I think that we can't have uh, this stock show wrap up without Calvin Simpson Hunt talk. I just feel like as a player that came in last summer and those guys the the summer enrollees almost always get overlooked no matter what because the the catch up time uh is almost almost always impossible for them to to make up because once you hit fall camp you're not doing a lot of the the basic stuff that you do in spring and so you are way behind but from just a physical standpoint and what he's able to do versatility wise playing inside outside the speed he brings, the physicality he brings to the cornerback position. Like we have talked about that position as one of the deeper ones in the room. And we've talked about like a four, four guys for pretty much, uh, including Jordan Hancock in that conversation with Denzel Burke and Davis Nagmanosin and, and Jermaine Matthews. But like Calvin Simpson Hunt belongs in that conversation and should not be uh, removed from it uh, moving forward. Like he's going to play. Yeah, I think he is. I think it's a that's an astute observation and a good pick that I think Austin and I were hoping to make, and you took it before we did. We all were hoping yeah. to drive it in the last <laughs> round. Okay. Yeah. Just like it, letting Berm go first. That's right. I got to pivot now. Um, give me, yeah, give me, give me some some Jalen McLean. I I, I am. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray that that wasn't the Kai Stokes spring game spike that we never see again. Like I, mm. it feels different to me, and I don't know why. I think just because I want it to be different. Um, I thought he looked really good in, in in the spring game. I I I feel better about the safety depth because of like him and Jaden Bonsu. Like I, I think that was a legitimate concern maybe going into spring, especially with a couple guys out. But credit to Jaden Bonsu and Jalen McLean for making the most out of extended reps that they got in the spring. Um, they, to me, they both look like they could play if Ohio State needed them to, which might be crazy to say about a true freshman in McLean. But I thought in coverage he was good. I thought he was really physical. He seemed to have like pretty good play recognition of, of like what was happening out there too. Just seems like a, a smart kid, 
And what Macareri said about him earlier in the spring is like is is kind of like in the back of my head. Um, he said they track they track how well guys like pursue the ball. Um, and I don't really know how they do that, but he said they track it. And he said that Jalen McLean always graded out like near the top of the safety room um, in in that particular category, uh, which I think says a lot about a young player and his instincts and like just his football IQ. And when you have those two things, the physical stuff will come, even though that that seems like it's it's pretty good for Jalen McLean right now, too. So he, he looks to me like somebody who's got a really bright future. The signing day comparisons were Jordan Fuller, and that those are not by accident. And I think the real lesson here is that as long as New Jersey exists, Ohio State safety depth is going to be okay. <laughs> I was going to expand the net a little bit and say that the safety depth is a stock up, which so- sounds counterintuitive when you look at the offseason, both portal windows now with Cedric Hawkins going in uh, on Tuesday um, and then watching Ohio State be a little bit shorthanded through spring. You think, oh, well. Things could get dicey in a hurry, but it doesn't. It it didn't really feel that way. And Berm, I know we talked maybe a month ago. Like, is that a that was a position you had highlighted? It could be something that Ohio State had to consider as it went into late April and this portal window. Um, I know I've said it. I think in every single show this week, but like Inky Jones is an athlete, man. That guy. He, he's he going to pass a McLean? Is he going to jump up there and get in the mix with a? With the way Bonsu played throughout spring, no, probably not. But as a as a safety net, as a walk on, that's a pretty darn good one. Again, based on what I saw, which maybe the other ten practices were terrible, but I doubt it because the five I saw were pretty pretty freaking good. So uh, I think they're in a pretty good spot. Like they, Bill, you've made the point that the number that they want to get to in terms of scholarship guys, they're short of that, and we know that they've had several off season departures at that position. You'd think, well. There must be some need to go get it. Uh, another body or two. If there's a veteran who's willing to sit behind Lathan Ransom and Caleb Downs, the best safety combination in the country. Like, if that happens, like I won't be surprised by it because of the uh, because of the raw numbers. But I think in terms of talent and getting through the season, Ohio State still has exactly what it needs at safety, and pretty much any program in the country would trade spots with what Ohio State and Matt Dreary has to work with right now. They're a good group, man. They're like they're <clears throat> so what they're the two starters. I guess we'll see what happens with like Jihad Carter, right? But I mean, they're like legitimately six deep at two safety spots. It's yeah. kind of crazy. <laughs> it it feels impossible for me to wrap my head around Jihad Carter having a role on this team. Uh in, yeah, in, fair. In the he hasn't, so, so. Yeah. if he's gonna have one, maybe on special teams, I can see it. And you're gonna need that depth. But again, when when you have guys like uh, Brenton Jones, Inky, like you, you gotta, you can use them and he can certainly play on special teams. I mean, that's a kid who was a basketball player, track and field football, like at Steubenville high school, like they understand real, you know, quality football in Ohio. And when you get Ohio kids like that, who are all in and committed to basically being willing to throw their bodies around uh, for the football team, like those guys generally stick around, uh, and find a way to contribute. And I, I, I don't know that we've seen that level of commitment from Jihad Carter since he's been at Ohio State. This might be a different conversation and a whole other show, Bill, but it. I remember when Jim Knowles got here and we had that conversation so often. It's like, well, it's a three safety situation. Like Ohio State has to recruit to that. The numbers have to be different. I. This goes back to last spring, and I talked to Tim Walton about this when they were starting to experiment, not just with Jordan Hancock, but like cross-training corners to play the nickel spot. To me, I don't, it feels like it's two safeties and like the nickel has become a corner and that's changed the math in some ways. Like we're not really talking about it in terms of three safeties anymore. We're talking about two corners, two safeties and a nickel, which is like obviously a hybrid of both and could play either way. But I don't, it doesn't feel like it's the same topic that we had two years ago. No, I I agree with you. I think it is different. Um, Because like Tanner McAllister, like wouldn't be in the cornerback room. Like, Like that guy's a safety who was playing the nickel. And I think that's, more often than not, how Jim Knowles utilized that position before he got here. But I, I think it makes much more sense to have like a, a more of a cornerback in that position, like a Jordan Hancock, like a Jermaine Matthews in the future, perhaps Miles Lockhart. Like all those guys are, are cornerbacks kind of by trade. So I, I that does change the math. Like if I think the number was 10 that I that I've been working off of, but if it's only two deep safety positions, it's probably more like seven or eight that they're looking for. And if they're 
one off from that, then it's not the end of the world. Yeah, the talent changed the math, though. It wasn't that they <laughs> changed the slot. Like, That's they right. just got a whole hell of a lot better in the slot, and now you don't have to deal with that. And the other safety that they felt like they had to experiment with is now a Sam or a Will linebacker. So, like, you, the, the talent has changed the equation, I think, more so than Jim Knowles. Uh, wanting to change his philosophy, but uh, that's that's neither here nor there. The point is, you've got really good players, and you got to get them on the field. So, you know, why take them off? Yeah, that's a stock up there. Lots of stock ups. Uh, we turned it around after a, a negative beginning to the show. It wasn't that's negative. <laughs> just honest. That's, it, was, it was real. That's just sperm <laughs> spitting facts. I know. I got no problem with that. Mm. I want you to. Uh, we have to be rational, don't we? Yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. Like that's, it's, you know, there's only one football. There's only 11 guys on defense. How can everyone play at once? Irrational stock tips are how everyone goes broke. And we don't want anyone to do that when they watch the podcast daily on a Thursday morning for a stock watch for Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward. We appreciate you joining us. We'll be back again with some daily tomorrow on Friday. It'll be a freaky Friday edition and we'll see you then.